So let's say this is the resurrection of Jesus. I look at this and say, right, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is very, very, very small, very low value indeed. So if I was to believe the claim that Jesus resurrected, I would need to fill up my pint glass with a lot more stuff. The fact that miracles do in fact stand out against uh, this regular natural order, the way nature normally behaves, cannot be taken as evidence against miracles when used as signs, because that very hypothesis predicts with very high probability that that's exactly what you'll find. We are going to be today actually arguing about why are our background knowledges, why are our worldviews different? Hello and welcome along to this week's edition of the programme. If you're new here to Unbelievable, do make sure to check the info where you can find links to our regular newsletter. You can also get hold of the show on a weekly basis via our podcast. Do make sure to like and subscribe as well if you're watching here on video on YouTube. Well, on today's show, we're asking, do extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence? It's a famous maxim uh, popularised by Carl Sagan, but arguably originating with David Hume. And he argued that the likelihood of miraculous events was so intrinsically improbable that the type of evidence required to justify belief in them would be overwhelmingly larger than for other kinds of events. Um, we'll be asking if Hume was right in the company of two Jonathans today. Jonathan Pierce is an atheist blogger and writer whose recent books include Why I Am Atheist and Not a Theist. And uh, the subtitle is How to Knowledge, Meaning and Morality, How to Do Knowledge, Meaning and Morality in a Godless World. And also The Resurrection, A Critical Examination of the Easter Story, both of which will be relevant to today's conversation. Uh, Jonathan McClatchy is a Christian apologist with a background in biology. Uh, he's recently established a new resource called talkaboutdoubts.com, which aims to help Christians who are experiencing doubts or deconstruction to talk about it one-to-one -one with another Christian thinker. So we're asking today, do extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence? Or is that a faulty way of assessing the way evidence works? Um, this one, I think, is inevitably going to be a bit philosophical, but we'll try to keep it user friendly, explaining any complex terms as we go along. So welcome along, uh, Jonathan Pierce and Jonathan McClatchy. And because you're both um, very confusingly called Jonathan today, I'm going to use acronyms. Um, JM for Jonathan McClatchy, JP for Jonathan Pierce. Um, so JP, first of all, um, welcome along. Uh, welcome back. It's been just over a year, I think, since you were last with us doing a debate on the Nativity with Lydia McGrew, I think, was the last time you appeared. Tell us what you've been up to in the last year. I know you're, you're, uh, you know, you, you, you seem to be prodigious in terms of the book writing. You've got another one, I think, due to appear yes. shortly. But tell us what you've been working on recently. Well, thank you for inviting me on. Uh, hopefully, it will be an absolute pleasure. Uh, last time I was on, I was debating uh, the Nativity of Critical Examination with uh, Lydia McGrew, and I'm writing a trilogy of books whereby I've since um, brought out the resurrection of Critical Examination of the Easter story uh, that we'll be debating it in applying the maxim today. Uh, which I think, yeah, I'm really proud of that book. It's had loads of great endorsements. And I also brought out a book called Why I Am Atheist and Not a Theist, a nice bit of wordplay there, mm -hmm. uh, which is about building up my worldview from the bottom up. And again, that's something that's pretty relevant for today, which is, you know, what are we bringing to the table? How are we constructing our worldview? And are we starting from the bottom, you know, stripping everything back and then starting from the bottom and working upwards to then arrive at a conclusion? Or are we starting at a conclusion and trying to back Phil. So, so that's what I'd be doing. I've also got another book coming out, 30 Arguments Against God, uh, The Existence of God. And also I'm working on the third part of the trilogy, which is The Exodus, a critical examination of the, East, of the Moses story, which is also possibly relevant because I wouldn't mind mentioning some of the Old Testament miracles today or the Hebrew Bible miracles. So that's what I've been doing. Um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, do, do, do you want to speak to Jay well, now? Well, I, I was going, going to say um, all of those sound really interesting. And, and who knows, maybe we could get you back on for the for the Exodus one, because uh, there's I've been wanting to re redo the Exodus story. Uh, I'm co-writing. Time, that so. with, a, with an archaeologist so actually that's that, yeah, it should be it should be good oh well well that that sounds fascinating well thanks for coming back jonathan p jp uh for today's purpose of today's show uh jm jonathan mcclatchy um also a welcome back to you it's been probably a little longer since we had you on the show um so tell us uh, tell us what life is like for you at the moment i know you've been um very busy yeah uh, you've got married i think probably since the last time we had you on and living in the us at the moment so so tell us what what life is looking like for you right so i thanks so much justin for having me on again it's a pleasure to be here um 
yeah, I got married in 2019. I completed my PhD at Newcastle University in January of 2020. Um, I currently work as an assistant professor of biology at uh, a local Christian college in Boston called Sattler College, um, which is an Anabaptist school. I, I teach uh, principles of biology to freshman students, genetics and genomics. I teach bioethics. I teach microbiology. So uh, that's uh, what I've been up to um, over the last uh, two and a half years. We actually just got recently accredited and we're now in our fourth year of operation as a school. So Wonderful. Tell me about talkaboutdoubts.com. What's that, what's that all about? Yeah, so talkaboutdoubts.com is a ministry that is geared towards um, mentoring and counseling Christians or sometimes ex-Christians who are struggling with doubts in regards to the veracity of the Christian faith. So this is something I've done on my personal website since 2016, uh, and I've been mentoring uh, Christians who are walking through a deconstruction process. Uh, I've typically uh, had on average one or two requests a week per, through my uh, personal website. And more recently, I thought that it would be uh, um, a good idea to bring in other scholars and experts in different fields and uh, and um, push the advertising for this sort of project uh, more and get more uptake, uh, which I wouldn't be able to handle all by myself. But we have a team so far of more than 30 scholars and experts in various fields. We have some um, big names associated uh, with our team. We have uh, Dr. Timothy McGrew, who's been on Unbelievable before a couple of times. We've got um, Dr. Stephen Meyer of the Discovery Institute, uh, who's involved. And um, Dr. Luke Barnes has also been um, on this show before. So, um, so basically people submit a form through the website and that comes uh, uh, to us and we um, th review the requests uh, for a conversation and then we send them out to uh, the individual that would be most suitable for answering that particular question. And different scholars are down for different frequencies or some are taking calls up to once a week, some up to once a month and so forth. And so that helps us to determine who best to send that to. And then that scholar will get in touch with that um, uh, inquirer and set up a one-on-one a -on -one Zoom call to discuss their doubts with them in confidence and help them to develop, um, answer their, their questions and doubts, educate them about the evidence for Christianity and help them to develop a protocol for working through their doubts uh, and concerns in an intellectually responsible and methodical way. Hmm. And, and, and what's the advantage of this sort of much more, if you like, one-to-one -one way of doing things than just giving people, you know, lots of articles on a website that might hopefully address their concerns or questions. Yeah, I think it's certainly more personable and uh, allows us to develop a, a relationship with these people. I, some people I've mentored over a period of several months or even years. Um, I One person actually um, has reconverted to Christianity through this ministry project. Um, I have other people who've said that it's um, changed their life in the sense that they would have walked away had they not had this uh, intervention. and. Uh, I, and having a one-on-one -on -one call uh, via Zoom with them allows them to ask their questions in a live way um, instead of reading an article and then having to write back with their questions and wait um, some days for a response. They get a, a response right there and then, and they're actually talking to someone who's a bona fide expert in that particular field. Mm. Well, it sounds it's a quite a remarkable project to have taken on. Uh, Talkaboutdoubts.com. Just be interested in JM, in, um, in uh, JP even, in your uh, your response to that. What, what, what do you make of this particular project? Actually, I did want to say something to that, which is it sounds very much like William Lane Craig's Reasonable Faith website, but it's more democratic. So it's, it's, instead of saying you have some kind of authoritarian figure of William Lane Craig just delivering his views on everything or his team, because he has a team. But, uh, but, it, but actually, I quite like the idea that no this question will be best answered by this particular person so it's 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 sending it to the to the right person for the job so you know although I, i'll disagree almost entirely with everything that, that your experts will say no doubt it's it's, it's a worthy cause if, if that's yeah if that's i I, I was going to say um jm that um in a sense <laughs> W could you imagine something like this for, for the atheist? I mean, is is this primarily just for Christians, really, who are going through doubts? Or would you anticipate an interested inquirer, an agnostic or atheist who's got questions also being able to access this particular service? Yeah, we have uh, atheists that get in touch with us and want and uh, have sincere questions about the Christian faith, uh, want to learn about the the evidence for it and uh, so yeah I, I very much welcome a sincere atheist we're not uh, an informal debate club so if you're just wanting a one-on-one -on -one debate then sorry you might want to try elsewhere um perhaps that's justin if you'll have you on to do a debate but uh <laughs> yeah we're um we're more interested in having one-on-one -on -one, uh, in, uh, informal conversations with people that are sincerely interested in exploring uh, the question of whether or not christianity is true 
Well, I'll, I'll leave links to that from today's show, talkaboutdoubts.com, also to your own website, Jonathan McClatchy, and yours as well, Jonathan Pierce, um, a tippling philosopher over at Pathios, where you can find out all about the books. Well, the, so actually, here's an interesting thing to say about that. So last time we, sp- I, I was on debating with David French about cancel culture, and uh, the non-religious mm. channel at Pathios has pretty much just been cancelled so uh um oh. because we didn't align we were too uh, anti-religious obviously and too political so we literally it's been cancelled so th- there's a brand new platform just starting up which is big news actually because uh, you might be very interested mm. in this uh, justin because it's it's a media platform predominantly based in america called only sky that will be aiming to represent uh, the non-religious across the world but predominantly in america to begin with uh, and i have been asked to come and join that as a columnist there so uh, watch this space because it's going to go live in the next few weeks and it is a, a news and media organization p- particularly tailored for the non-religious well, I, I look forward to hearing more about that, and perhaps we we can have some representatives from from this new network uh, in due course. Is is that a reference to the John Lennon song "Above Us Only Sky"? So it, yeah, it, it's the idea that you know when you look up, there's only sky. You know, it's it, it, it exactly. So okay. yeah, yeah, there's good references. There you go. All right. Well, look, great, great to get some background on both of what you've been up to in the, the last year or two, uh, and and as I say, links will be with today's show. But let's get into the topic that we're here to discuss, which is. Do extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence? Um, uh, Jonathan Pierce, why don't you begin by outlining your case here? Again, it'll have to be a very much a nutshell yeah. approach. You know, <laughs> This is a five-hour debate. Um, specifically, exactly. It, essentially, this is a case against miracles. Um, and, and maybe you could sort of outline how you've presented this specifically. You've got quite a fun analogy of the kinds of evidence that would be required to you know, for a fairly normal claim like I own yeah. a dog compared to some rather more extravagant claim. So so go go ahead with, with the way that you... you so uh, th- this might quite annoy both of you, but I'm not really interested in talking about Hume today. And in fact, talking about the maxim a- a- as a whole, as far as a rational argument, because I think the maxim is a subjective epistemological statement or maxim. So epistemology is a study of knowledge and truth. So wh- when we say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, what we're really saying is... Claims that are out of the ordinary for me require evidence that is out of the ordinary for me, for me to believe those claims. In the same way that for JM, a claim that is out of the ordinary for him and for you, Justin, will require evidence that is out of the ordinary for you, for you to believe the claim. So this is actually universal, but it is subjective. And and so what, what what this then means is that how come that I have the same access to the same evidence as JM has, and I have exactly the same access to exactly the same rational arguments as JM does, that we end up with different um, conclusions, and that's because of psychology, right? So really, it, it's it, we are going to be today actually arguing about why are our background knowledge is why are our worldviews different and I'll, and I'll leave it just with with this analogy so the way I like to simplify this is I, I here's a pint and for those who are listening and not seeing uh, I'm holding a pint glass which has a tiny amount of orange cordial at the bottom that orange cordial represents evidence and for me this is a tiny amount of evidence in a whole pint where if I have a full pint I have a justified belief Right. So let's say this is the resurrection of Jesus. I look at this and say, right, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is very, very, very small, very low value indeed. So if I was to believe the claim that Jesus resurrected, I would need to fill up my pint glass with a lot more stuff. And that would require me to fill it up with faith, uh, motivated reasoning, biases, uh, stuff like, you know, heaven and hell really driving me to want to believe this is true. And the other thing I can do is artificially expand my my va- evaluation of the evidence so that this tiny sliver of orange cordial takes up three quarters of the glass. And my point would be that JM would look at the Gospels. We have the same access to the same evidence and same arguments, but I look at the Gospels and that's how I value it. He looks at the Gospels and he will evaluate the evidence as being three quarters of the glass. So the question is, really today, what we need to be talking about is what are we bringing to the table that means that our evaluations of both 
the claim, like what is an ordinary claim for me is not an ordinary claim for JN. So I might say naturalistic abiogenesis, so the life starting naturalistically is a normal claim for me. So I won't need as much evidence as he will need. He, he will see naturalistic abiogenesis as an out of the ordinary claim. There, and he will need evidence that is far beyond what I would require. And the same for the resurrection. So what do we bring into the table and how can we meet in such a way that we start understanding each other and start having maybe a benchmark for, for how we arrive at our, our world views and our background knowledge. Mm. Okay. Well, thank, thank you for the introduction. And, and J Jonathan M., in a, in a moment, I, it'd be great to hear your response to this analogy of the, the pint glass with only a small amount of evidence at the bottom and what we fill the rest of it with for, to, to get our hold of our belief. But um, just let's start with the maxim that we're talking about here uh, and briefly do extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence what what is your overall response to that way of looking at uh, claims around christianity around miracles and that kind of thing so it's certainly true that uh, the um, amount of evidence that will be deemed sufficient to justify belief in a propositional claim will um, inversely um, correlate with the the prior probability so is the prior probability um, uh, declines, the amount of evidence that you need to provide sufficient justification for a belief will increase. So what, is, what do we mean by prior probability? So that's a, a, um, a probability theory term. It's uh, a term used in Bayesian statistics. Um, and uh, prior probability basically denotes the probability of a proposition being true before you've looked at the new data, just based on the background information alone. Um, and um, and the, the, so the, the prior probability just take, takes into account what you know in the background before you've looked at the new evidence that you are considering. Now, what do we mean um, by uh, the concept of evidence? I think it's very important to define what we actually mean by evidence, what counts as evidence. And as a Bayesian, I would define evidence as a, as a likelihood ratio, which measures the strength of a particular piece of evidence. And I know Jonathan would agree with this, or at least that's my impression from reading his work, um, that um, the, the evidence can be expressed as the probability of that evidence existing given the hypothesis is true versus the probability of that evidence existing given the hypothesis is false. So um, we talk in Bayesian probability theory in terms of a Bayes factor. So a Bayes factor of three, for example, means that that evidence is three times more likely to exist given your hypothesis is true than given its falsity. Now, to say that something is evidence for a particular hypothesis does not commit you to saying that that hypothesis is true. You can say that there's evidence for a hypothesis that you believe is false. Um, and what is incumbent upon us is to adjudicate where does the balance of evidence lie? Are there more numerous and more substantive objections to believing a proposition or more substantive and more numerous objections to not believing a proposition? Um, so um, the, ev the way that I would tend to make a, a case for things like the resurrection and other aspects of the Christian faith would be as a cumulative argument where no one of the individual pieces of evidence is individually sufficient to establish and justify the conclusion, but taken cumulatively because the evidence is multiplied together. If you have two pieces of evidence, each with a base factor of 10, for example, that's a cumulative base factor of 100, right? 10 times 10. Um, and so the evidences begin to multiply and accumulate very, very rapidly. What do you make of this particular analogy John, Jonathan Pierce has of the, the pint glass? And essentially his view is that there's, you know, you're all looking at the same evidence for something like the resurrection. And in his view, it's a very small amount of evidence at the bottom of the glass and that all kinds of other factors, psychological factors, um, you know, your commitment to Christianity, whatever it might be, sort of effectively fill up the rest of the glass to, to make it sort of possible for you to or believe expand the, what, the or expand the evidence itself yeah or both or indeed expand the evidence right for sure i think jonathan and i have different priors for something like the resurrection and we can discuss i think a bit later how we assess the priors because i think that we assess the priors in different ways but i think that we would agree in principle, that the amount of evidence you'll need will be inversely correlated with the prior. So if you have a very small prior, you're going to need more evidence to justify a conclusion. And uh, I don't see beliefs as binary, right? Either you believe it or you don't, but more as a confidence level, right? You, you, we have different confidence levels and you might justify confidence in a belief at say 90% versus 95% and so forth. And that will, that, that can be, um, 
quantified or, or assessed, determined by a, a Bayesian calculus. Can, can I give an example of that? Uh, yes, please. I was going to ask for an example, just just to, to make it clear what this sort of idea of the prior and the, the, the evidence. So the claim, so I've got a table, right? If I said to you, I've got a table, I would expect that's a really ordinary claim. And it's an ordinary claim for all of us. So actually, I've chosen something that is that, that we can all agree on. So our background knowledge is that most people own tables. He's claimed he's got a table. I will believe that, which has a very low, a very high prior probability of being true, which means that, that most people have tables. Therefore, someone claiming they've got a table is likely to be true, irrespective of the evidence he presents. And the evidence I presented to you is simply verbal testimony. I've just said I've got a table and I can guarantee you'd be prepared to believe me. And most people on earth will be prepared to believe me, okay? Because it's not an out of the ordinary claim for anyone. But if I said to you, I flew to the moon last night on a unicorn, right? You would, and I've chosen that. As some people say, why do you choose these ridiculous um, examples? The reason I do is because no one's got vested interest in that at all. So this is, this is something we can all agree on. This is outside of our, our ordinary claims, right? Outside of our, our background knowledge of how the world works, you shouldn't be able to fly to the moon on the back of a unicorn. So therefore, that's an that's a insanely improbable claim. Like before we look at the evidence, it's breaking the laws of nature. Unicorns don't exist. Yada, yada, yada. So before we look at the evidence, it's got a really vanishingly low probability chance of being true. So in order to overcome, this is what JM was saying, in order to overcome that very low prior probability, you have to have really high posteriors. You have to have really high evidential uh, ev really high levels and qualities of evidence to overcome the low prior. And so I would be, I would be required by you guys to, to present a heck of a lot of evidence just so that you would be justified in believing my claim that I flew to the moon and back. Dialing it back ever so slightly, say, say you had said, um, you know, on the one hand, I own a table, neither of us need anything more than your verbal, uh, you know, evidence for that. Say that you had said, I flew to the moon yesterday. Now, um, would it make any difference if you were Elon Musk, if that was some of the background knowledge uh, and that you owned a massive space program? Would would that kind of affect the, if you like, how much evidence yeah. I need from you? On because that that's basis? part of our background knowledge about how the world is, right? We know. So if I was Elon Musk and made that claim, we know that Elon Musk owns X, Y and Z and it's not breaking the natural laws. So this is this is actually if it's flying in a space shuttle. Right. Then it's not breaking the natural laws. And this is something that could happen. So what's the probability of Elon Musk claiming that and that being true? Uh, and we, we would be assessing the probabilities based on that. OK, I just want to get a sense of, of how these sort of prior probabilities and so on, background information makes a difference to what kind of level of evidence we're kind of, uh, you know, expecting someone to, to bring. The Bayesian, Bayesian probability will depend. So what, when JM talked about the numbers, he just said rather arbitrarily, you know, right, rightfully so, he said like, you know, this number represents this or whatever. That will depend on your background knowledge. And this is why I, I think it, that's the most important thing to talk about is how do we arrive at our background knowledge? Because that will determine your Bayesian probability analyses. Okay, so some responses to all of this, John. Than M. Yeah, I, I agree with that in principle. And I think the, the crux of the debate then is how do you assess the priors, which I think will be the point of contention between us. So um, my impression from reading your book, Jonathan, is that a very important factor for you in assessing the priors is the frequency by which an event occurs or to what extent it is precedented in our experience. Would that be an accurate summary of your view? That, that's certainly part of it. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, okay. it's, it's, but no, so, it's not only that. It's also the background knowledge. So it's also about: Do I believe that, that miracles are are well, not a priori? So this is a frequency. It's like okay, in, it, I can conceptually agree that miracles might be able to take place, but I've never seen them take place, and that that's the frequency thing that you're that you're referring to. Okay. So what's the relevance of that for you, Jonathan McClatchy? The the frequency issue that that. JP says. Yeah, so I don't consider a frequentist approach to be a very helpful tool in assessing the prior probability of a miracle claim when the miracle claim is understood to function as an authenticating sign, as it is in both the Old and New Testament. So in both the Old and New Testament, the purpose for which miracles are wrought is to authenticate a messenger. So you see this, for example, in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 18, for example, uh, Moses tells the people that you can evaluate and assess, adjudicate whether someone really speaks from God by virtue of to what extent he is 
consistently accurate in forecasting the future. In, in, and we see this is a um, miracles used in this way with Moses, for example, as well as authenticating sign um, at, at, before Pharaoh. In the New Testament, you see um, Jesus, for example, um, uh, in Matthew 11, John the Baptist sends disciples to Jesus asking, are you the one we're expecting or should we be looking for another? And Jesus says to John the Baptist's disciples, go back to John, tell him what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, the deaf uh, hear, the, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and so forth. And in other words, go back and tell him about the authenticating signs. John even uses that expression, signs, and, and says that these signs um, are written about so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and therefore have life in his name. Um, and so if miracles are to function as signs, then they have to stand out against a regular natural order. Uh, they have to deviate from the normal course of nature. And so the hypothesis that God has used miracles as authenticating signs predicts very strongly that they will stand out against the normal course of nature, go against the way that nature behaves if left to itself. And so the fact that miracles do in fact stand out against uh, this regular natural order, the way nature normally behaves, cannot be taken as evidence against miracles when used as signs, because that very hypothesis predicts with very high probability that that's exactly what you'll find. A really interesting point, and I'm going to come back to you, JP, in just a moment. We're going to go to a break, but I suppose the point is there, Jonathan McClatchy, that by definition, a miracle is a rare event, because if it wasn't, then it wouldn't be you know a, a momentous thing an interesting thing someone that something as you say out of out of the ordinary we'll, we'll see what jonathan pierce has to say in response to that in a moment's time we're asking today do extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence we'll be back with my guests jonathan mcclatchy and jonathan pierce in just a moment have you ever found yourself tongue-tied when someone asks you is there evidence for god what about suffering did jesus really rise from the dead I'd like to introduce you to Confident Christianity, our online apologetics course, featuring video training from world-renowned thinkers such as William Lane Craig, John Lennox, Amy Orr Ewing and Gary Habermas, you'll learn how to understand, defend and share your faith with confidence. I'll also share lessons I've learned from over 15 years of hosting atheists and Christians in dialogue. You can enrol now at premier.org.uk forward slash course or click the link with this video. Welcome back to the show. Bit of a philosophical debate today, but one which hinges on things like miracles, uh, claims of uh, extraordinary events in the Old and New Testament, particularly, of course, the resurrection. That's one I'm sure we'll talk about in the course of today's show. Do extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence? My guests are Jonathan Pierce and Jonathan McClatchy. Um, Talkaboutdoubts.com is the new website from Jonathan McClatchy. And uh, he's here to talk about the doubts that many people have, obviously, around things like the resurrection, uh, extraordinary claims of miracles and so on, with Jonathan Pierce, who's a, a writer. And uh, again, some of his books available from the links with today's show. So in that last segment, Jonathan Pierce, um, Jonathan McClatchy saying, to say that, you know, to, to, to say that the reason that, you know, miracles are unlikely is because of their, how infrequently they occur or supposedly occur, uh, the, the fact that you haven't seen one yourself and so on. Well, that is just a factor of miracles. They, they are unusual uh, because by nature they're there to do something unusual and therefore that can't be used as evidence against their existence. What, what's your view on that? I think it's in what he was saying, he presupposes A, the truth of the the claim that god exists uh and b he presupposes the truth of these other miracles uh and signs in particularly the old testament uh which i think are is hugely problematic uh, and in fact you speak to any hebrew bible scholar now i mean go and speak to someone like joel baden and, and say do you think prophecies uh were predictive and he'll say no they were written ex eventu, which means prophecies, no serious Hebrew scholar, evangelical Christians are a different thing, but no serious Hebrew scholar thinks that, that there was any kind of prophetic writing going on in, in the Old Testament. And it was written after the fact uh, to, 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 you know, um, supposedly pr prophesy an event. Um, but but I, 
I also, would, you know, I'd be questioning basically Hebrew, the history of the Hebrew Bible entirely. So when he talks about Moses, I don't think Moses existed as a person. So I think it's really problematic. I mean, there's no historical evidence that Moses existed. You look at the Elephantine papyri, which are from the 400s BCE. And these are these hundreds of early Jewish documents. And they have no reference to the Torah, no reference to any names in the Torah. We've got no reference to any of the stories, Exodus, anything. It looks like the Hebrew Bible was written pretty darned late. And none, none of it is particularly historically defensible or archaeologically so so anyway but the point is that that i think and it, jonathan's done this in a couple of essays he's written on this topic and he says the truth of the resurrection is is given a higher probability given the truth of the virgin birth and that's given a higher probability given the, or the resurrection given the truth of isaiah fifty three ten, and given the truth of all these old testament things and, and i'd say hang on you're saying something that i think has got a very low probability is 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 founded is is more likely to be true because of something else that's got even lower probability and and something else that's got even lower probability and it's the turtles all the way down and i think it's the whole framework it's the whole it's like the gospels as a whole or the bible as a whole that needs to be stripped away start again what do we know historically well let's put that back to you then uh, jm um so this is where we're talking about sort of whether something that is improbable like someone coming back to life um whether it's made more probable by some of the background knowledge and and just just for the sake of you know those who are watching and listening just sketch out some of the reasons why for instance in the case of the resurrection of jesus you think that some of the background information does make it more likely that that really did happen and then we'll come to some of jonathan pierce's objections to that very background knowledge that you claim make claim to sure just a brief word about what jonathan said just there um I, my, my argument that I just made doesn't presuppose any of that. Uh, all I'm saying is that, in principle, a miracle is an event which stands out from the normal course of nature. And therefore, the fact that a miracle deviates from the normal course of nature can't be used as evidence against a miracle when when defined as special divine action as, uh, as an authenticating sign. Um, and so what Jonathan's wanting to do is he's wanting to get into the particulars of whether... Um, we have evidence for the historicity of Moses and the Exodus and Old Testament miracles and prophecies and so forth. Um, and that's all fair and well. Um, one can discuss that, the, but the, it doesn't have any bearing on, in principle, the argument that I just outlined. Now, there's, um, now let me give an analogy, which uh, I think um, um, helps to clarify this debate. Um, and this is an analogy that I draw from my colleague and friend, Dr. Timothy McGrew, who's an epistemologist and philosopher at Western Michigan University. And that is, uh, so he, he points out that, um, there's a um, there's a interpretation of nuclear physics which says that uh, proton a spontaneous proton decay happens and it's such a rare event that has never been observed it's an unprecedented event and yet there's a theoretical underpinning for this um, interpretation that uh, spontaneous nuclear uh, nuclear decay hap uh, proton decay happens and so we um, and there's actually a whole wiki page on the theoretical underpinnings of that um, and, but, and, and scientists, of course, have, have set up these uh, very sensitive detectors and underground tanks to try to detect this spontaneous uh, proton decay. And, um, and, if they, uh, and of course, it, it's not that this is just a random guess, even though there's no precedent for this, there's no um, example of this happening in our observation, but there is a theoretical underpinning. And so frequency there isn't the most helpful metric for assessing the prior probability. You also want to look for whether there's a theoretical underpinning for this hypothesis. And likewise, with the case for Christianity, the case for the resurrection in particular, I think that you can make a similar case from a theoretical underpinning, a background information that stands independently of the extent to which there is precedence in our experience of the miraculous. Um, and um, one other point I'll make there is... Uh, that the the idea that miracles um, go against uniform human experience, which was the idea put forward by David Hume, is uh, controversial. In fact, uh, Craig Keener has a two-volume set on the subject of miracles, uh, where he outlines case after case after case of documented miracle claims in the modern world, many of which are within his own sphere of, of uh, acquaintances and friends, contacts. 
Uh, he talks about uh, people being uh, people who were blind from birth being uh, healed when they were prayed over. He talks about uh, people who had cancer or MS, which uh, spontaneously disappeared um, after prayer. He talks about um, people being able to speak in, in tongues in foreign lands and be understood in people's native languages, even though they did not hitherto speak that language. And the, there's so many cases and so many diverse cases, often with independent, multiply, uh, often with multiple independent attestation, and often with medical documentation that suggests to me that although not everyone that claims to have experienced a miracle in, tr in fact has, there's enough that are credible to suggest to me cumulatively that the miracles are within the realm of human experience. And uh, you, of course, w um, one can argue against that and say, well, um, we can dismiss all of these miracle claims because they stand out against, they, they go against uniform human experience, but that's the very point of issue. And so it, re it requires that you engage in circular reasoning. Um, and then, yes, you're good. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask, you know, just before Jonathan Pierce comes back on this, um, I mean, coming back to the maxim that we started the show with, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Is it your view then that someone who says, look, Jonathan, if you want me to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you would not, I would not just need sort of, you know, some ancient, uh, you know, writings uh, in the New Testament that bear witness to it. I would need, you know, some kind of video testimony of it i would need something you know i don't know jesus christ appearing before me and telling me it really happened or so, something like really extraordinary a, a kind of super high level of and are you saying that actually you don't need all of that extraordinary evidence because with enough of these cumulative aspects of background knowledge whether it be that this was prophesied that this uh you know there were various reasons why this made sense in its context and everything else that that kind of if you like gives you enough um, that, that, if you like, more normal standards of evidence, such as written testimony uh, and that kind of thing, is enough to 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 kind of give you enough, you know, over fifty percent or whatever it might be probability that this really did happen. Well, just just explain why why this kind of means you don't need that extraordinary kind of of, of evidence. Sure. So um, let, I, I can give just a couple examples of independent lines of evidence that bear on Jesus' messianic and divine identity. Uh, one would be, I, I think there's merit to C.S. Lewis's trilemma argument that he fleshes out and develops in mere Christianity, um, which says that um, Jesus historically claimed divine status. I think there's a strong historical case for that. That being the case, one uh, there's three possible candidate explanations for that contention, one, um, for, for, for that testimonial claim. One is that Jesus lied about it. He was setting out to deceive others. One is that he's honestly mistaken, he's sincerely wrong, or one is that he really is who he claimed to be, the creator of the universe and uh, God incarnate. Um, and C.S. Lewis points out that um, that it's, it's um, that the two competing contenders, namely that he lied and that he was honestly mistaken, are implausible. Um, Jesus um, is, he gets himself crucified, um, he's executed in excruciating circumstances, um, um, for his um, messianic and divine self claims, and that provides some evidence uh, that he was sincere in that belief. And then there's also evidence that suggests that he was uh, um, that he that uh, he wasn't honestly mistaken, because it's very difficult to be honestly mistaken about uh, the fact that you are God incarnate, and the creator of the universe, unless you're completely insane. Uh, Jonathan, I think you want to respond. Oh, goodness, I, I want to respond at length to so much of what you said. Uh, just on that last bit, I think there's another option, which is his legend. Leg there was leg legendary embellishment. I think there's the Joanine problem, the synoptic problem. So you've got Matthew, Mark and Luke think he's the Messiah. Uh, John is the only one that thinks he's actually God. And uh, even if you do think he's a Messiah, which the Messianic age is supposed to bring about uh, a peace to Jerusalem, and peace to all of Israel. Uh, what happened after Jesus died? Uh, Jerusalem was raised and Israel has been been in, in conflict ever since. So he's, he's the, the most failed Messiah you can think of. But I don't th I think the, the, the synoptic gospels, gospels think he was a Messiah and not God. And I think John thought, thought after 80 years of theologi theologizing, thought he was God. But going back to Craig Keener's miracles, huge problems with that. I mean, read Ed Babinski's chapter in the, uh, the Case Against Miracles edited by John Loftus. But, but just look at the, the claims in Craig Keener. I mean, they're so poorly attested. It's, it, you know, I remember when that book came out, I took the first claim with a with a biologist contributor to my to my uh, then blog and we looked at one about tubular ligation and found out that that and we explained it naturalistically almost straight away it took us like two hours to debunk it but even the claims of leo bauer that he has in there where there's some he resurrects a baby 
all right? And you're like, okay, who's a baby? What's the email address? What's the telephone number? What's the address of these people? How, who are these people? No, no idea. No, no, no knowledge of them. Okay, so this is just an assertion of some guy in Nigeria, and I'm not disrespecting Nigeria, but you've just got some random guy, Leo Bauer. Okay, but what other ways of verifying these? claims do we have none okay so like if you're happy to believe that that's great but i i would need way way more evidence than craig keener remotely even provides so i think i think he's got hugely problematic uh, methodology in his book and i don't think his book does what what Christians think it does. When you've talked in your articles about multiple sclerosis, I've got primary progressive multiple sclerosis, right? So I can tell you a little bit about multiple sclerosis. And and you talk about two supposed miracles to do with MS sufferers, which are completely explicable by the fact that it's 85% of MS sufferers have relapsing remitting MS, which the very nature of, of the disease is that it relapses and then goes into remission. As, and so, you know, we can talk about MS. I'd love to talk about that. But, but what you have to do with modern miracles is you have to connect causality of remission and it's never growing back amputated arms it's always something that can naturally happen right and and you have to say this person was prayed for and i'm drawing a correlation a causation from praying to the remission right but what about all the times that people have got better without being prayed for what about all the failed prayers for people uh, and what about alternative explanations for these hypotheses so quite quite a lot uh, of responsing there uh, as well. I mean, and we've also got the issue of, um, you know, whether whether the the claims of prophecy in the Old Testament and you know the existence of Old Testament characters like Moses are are actually, uh, you know, lend credence to your uh, claim of the resurrection and so on as well, Jonathan. So th there's lots to potentially pick up on here. M maybe start though with the view that Jonathan Pierce just doesn't believe people like Craig Keener's research is anything like up to the bar needed to, to start to get you down the road of, you know, believing that there's some evidence for these kinds of miracle claims. Sure, absolutely. Um, so I, I'm not saying, and I, I don't believe that all of the claims that Keener covers in his uh, work on this subject are authentic miracles, but I think that there are enough of them which are plausible and enjoy multiple independent attestations, some with medical documentation that to suggest to me cumulatively that the case uh, for miracles is, is quite strong. So here's um, an example um, from Robert Larmer, who's a, a professor and chair of the Department of Philosophy at the University of uh, New Brunswick. Um, so he um, interviews um, Irene McDonald, um, who had been experiencing rapid deterioration from uh, clearly diagnosed multiple sclerosis, and the specialist warned her that um, she was going to die soon, her condition was terminal, and so she needed um, spinal injections uh, for a pain um, uh, every 10 days. And um, one Friday afternoon, um, uh, a friend told Irene that she was going to be healed. Um, and of course, Irene was skeptical, um, but uh, nonetheless, a dream um, and increased strength encouraged her. And so um, she asked on Sunday to be carried to church. And um, as she was being prayed for there, um, then a feeling spontaneously returned to her legs and her arms. And she had uh, control of her body and she regained muscular strength. Um, and so she um, was, walked from the church and was able to return to her pre-illness uh, activities. And that was more than 25 years ago, um, but her symptoms have not relapsed. Uh, and uh, there are other examples of that as well. I talked in my article on the subject, uh, which um, readers, uh, listeners can find on my website, jonathanmcclatchy.com forward slash writing. I also discussed the case of uh, Barbara Snyder, um, who was diagnosed with progressive multiple sclerosis. Um, this is uh, discussed by Lee Strobel in his book, The Case for Miracles, although it's with an interview uh, that he conducted with uh, Craig Keener. And uh, he, Craig Keener says that he confirmed the facts uh, with two physicians who treated her. He says um, there are numerous independent witnesses to her condition and years of medical records. In fact, two of her doctors were so astounded by her case that they've written about it in books, uh, end quote. So her, um, uh, Barbara's condition uh, continues to worsen and her diagnosis was confirmed through various uh, diagnostic tests. Uh, they conducted uh, spinal taps. And um, in the 16 years that followed, um, um, Keener says her condition continued to deteriorate. She um, spent months in hospitals, often uh, for pneumonia, after being unable to breathe. One half of her diaphragm was paralyzed, uh, which made her lung non-functional. Uh, the other half um, was operating at less than 50%. It was a, um, a tracheostomy tube was inserted into her neck. Um, oxygen was pumped from canisters in, in um, her garage. Uh, she lost control of her urination and bowels. Um, there was a catheter that was inserted into her bladder. 
Um, and she, um, she was le declared legally blind, um, unable to read, and only capable of seeing objects as grey shadows. Um, and a feeding tube so, was inserted so into her stomach. Op optic um, neuritis, as part of that, optic neuritis is a, is a hallmark of, of relapsing re remitting uh, multiple sclerosis. So I've got progressive, you don't generally get optic neuritis, which is where you can go blind, and then you regain your sight. So I know literally, literally probably 100 people that have lost their sight and regained it. Like, it's just, it's just part of MS, right? Uh, which is why I have to apply for you know sp specific driving licenses and whatnot, right? Okay, th th everything you're describing is also explicable naturalistically. Okay, but w what it is, what's happening is way. Uh, hey, well, I've got loads of problems with this, which is partly that all the sources for these two cases seem to be Christian sources. I've struggled to find any sources, uh, medical sources that, that, that recount all, all of these. But also, these are explicable naturalistically. What I'd like to know is when has God, is two things, when has God healed an amputee? And also, um, I think these sporadic, what I call sporadic miracles, are evidence against God, because it shows that God is cherry picking certain people. He's, he's saying, do you know what? You, you're a quadriplegic, you've been hate the faith healed by your church so i'm going to make you walk right so he sends this miracle and, and this guy can walk bill kent can walk right uh but at the same time you know all you other quadriplegics around the world i'm not going to do anything for you do you know all you people with covid you can die do you know all the people with malaria you can die you know that tsunami of two hundred forty thousand people i'm going to make this person with ms over there you know get better but that can be explained naturalistically but i let them get better but i allow 240,000 people to die in a tsunami so you've been thinking what is going on here that you can cherry pick these instances and also ignore all the other times when people have got better from ms but without being prayed for and without a miracle ignore all them ignore all the other unanswered prayers of people that didn't get better when they're prayed for and cherry pick these ones and connect it's a correlation fallacy and, and connect causality to that and say look god's done, made this sign but but that sign is more important than 240,000 people dying in a tsunami. I, I just find that really, really, and, and, and the evidence just isn't good enough. Like, I, I, sure, give me all the medical evidence for Barbara Snyder and for Irene McDonald. I want all the medical evidence before I can assess that claim properly. I mean, it sounds though, jo Jonathan P, that you're, you're willing to, in principle, believe that these people did get better. You just say yeah. it's explicable. By oh normal, yeah, you know, by, by if you know MS, it's yeah. massively variable, right. and it's it, uh, it's literally called relapsing remitting MS. Okay, what 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 then, Jonathan M, makes you feel that actually there is a miraculous explanation for these particular things? They weren't just relap, you know, um, things that happened in the natural course of of time. So Barbara Snyder was in hospice care at home. She had been told that she would um, she was going to die soon. Uh, she um, so Strobel explains in the book that um, by 1981 she'd been able to walk. Uh, she'd been hadn't been able to walk for seven years. She was confined to bed. Her body twisted like a pretzel into a fetal position. Her hands were permanently flexed to the point that her fingers nearly touched her wrists. Her feet was locked in a downward position. Um, Marshall explained to her fairly that it was just a matter of time before she would die. They agreed not to do any heroics, including. CPR or further hospitalization to keep her alive, this would only prolong the inevitable. Barbara entered hospice care in her home with a life expectancy of less than six months." End quote. So um, a caller uh, informed a radio station of the Moody Bible Institute about Barbara's story, and a request was made for listeners to pray for her. Um, and Barbara's um, church received some 450 letters from Christians indicating that they were praying for Barbara. And in 1981, on Pentecost Sunday, Barbara's aunt was uh, reading to Barbara some of the letters that they had received offering prayers for her healing, um, joined by two other friends. And Barbara reportedly heard a male voice speak from behind her, my child, get up and walk. Um, and according to Marshall, um, who was one of the doctors, Barbara, Barbara felt compelled to do immediately and what she was divinely instructed. So she literally jumped out of bed and removed her oxygen. She was standing on legs that had not supported her for years. Her vision was back and she was no longer short of breath. Even without her oxygen, her contractions were gone and she could move her feet and hands freely. Um, and so that same evening, there was a worship gathering at her church where her illness was widely uh, known about. And when the pastor asked if there were any announcements, she walks forward uh, to the astonishment of the congregation. And the following day, there was a um, they conduct, the doctors conducted a chest X-ray, which confirmed that her lungs were perfectly normal, and the collapsed lung was completely expanded, and the uh, intestine that had been vented to the abdominal wa wall was reconnected normally, um, and so she was restored to full health. And so that, do you know the frequency? of of all the times in history that people have got better from a condition without being prayed for 
because it because what you really need to do is show that that this one time when there was prayer and they got better right is 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 categorically different from all the times through history that people have had illnesses and got better like no matter how bad that illness is that they've got better but without being prayed for because what you're doing is you're counting the hits and ignoring the misses. So to me, this is until you can show that data, I don't think you're justified in believing it's a miracle because you're, you're, you're committing the correlation fallacy. Or the God of the gaps. Understand. I don't understand how, how she got better, but I'm assuming it must be God. Yeah, so um, two things. Um, so first of all, in regards to the cherry picking allegation that I only focus on those cases where uh, there is uh, – um, documentable answer to prayer and ignore the the, the misses. Um, I would say that there's an epistemic asymmetry such that the cases of um, mir um, documentable miracles is strong evidence that tends to confirm special divine action, whereas um, non uh, miraculous occurrences is only weak evidence against uh, against special divine action when when someone isn't spontaneously healed because there are explanations that can account for that for, for, within the context and framework of a judeo-christian worldview um, and we know from from the bible that god doesn't always answer prayers and god works in different people's experience in different ways and there are reasons that god has for that but what about when miracles take place i mean the double standards accusation so when you have miracles and this is, this is a really really important point so when you look at miracles that happened in in islam or in other cultures that are non-judeo christian so modern miracles uh, or or indeed islamic miracles from the quran like the six miracles of muhammad but when you look at modern miracles your threshold for believing them uh, for for evidence is much much higher because that's without your world view so you're like you're happy to believe judeo christian miracles where people People have played, prayed to your God and your followers have, have got better. But what about when, when this happens in another religion? Yeah, so I, I've tried to look into uh, miracle testimonies in other religions. I haven't found any um, literature which uh, does the same work that Keener has done in regards to Christian miracles. If you have one, I'd really like to read it. But to this point, I'm not aware of any. But is that to deny that miracles happen in any other religion? Um, and even, well, even like gurus like Satya Sai Baba, who's, who's got better attested miracles than Jesus, but, but we, we, none of us believe them. Okay, so even supposing that there are miracles in other religions, that um, still would point to a supernatural realm. So you could say that there are d demonic spirits involved, for example. Um, so uh, and in any case, uh, if, if, there's a, if there's a spiritual realm, then that um, undermines your case against the, the prior probability in the case of Jesus' resurrection. In the case of Sai Baba, uh, I think there's a difference between, say, materializing a watch, uh, which was the sort of miracles that Sai Baba would perform, versus uh, a claim like the resurrection of Jesus, where... No, no. Yeah. Well, no, because I, I, I've had the, this exact argument before when someone said, oh, these are just little little ones. And yes, I, OK, maybe to Jesus, because Jesus is God incarnate in human form. But as far as a miracle is concerned, if you're going to if you're going to materialize a watch, you are breaking the laws of nature as we know it. Like that is literally if that if that genuinely happened tomorrow in India. Satya Sai Baba generally did that. He has broken what we know about physics, right? So that is a massive deal. Like, I know it sounds, oh, he's just materialising watch. That, that would literally break our fundamental understanding of the universe. The point so was, it is pretty big. The, the point of comparison I was trying to make with the resurrection is not um, the importance of the event. The, 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 compar the point of comparison was rather that it's a lot more difficult to be honestly mistaken about observing your friend come back from the dead, especially given the polymodal or multi-sensory character of the resurrection encounters, where Jesus um, appears to not just individuals, but groups of people um, on multiple occasions in different contexts, um, with appointment, without prior appointment, uh, with it, and it involves uh, multiple sensory modes, including group conversations, physical contact, his extended course of 40-day time period, he has long discourses with his followers, uh, such as the Emmaus disciples and, and the Twelve. He um, is across a 40-day time period, so it's not one brief and confusing episode. That's very difficult to be honestly mistaken about, much more so than, say, materializing a watch, which can be done by a sleight of hand. Okay, so let, let, let's concentrate on them. So it, in the case of the resurrection, right, and you have Jesus appearing to 500, the, ev the, the, the in total evidence that we have for that claim of the dead, ri rise, dying and rising God-man spirit, uh, appearing to 500 people is like two lines in, in, in a letter that a religious leader sends to some new converts in order to convince them to believe what he believes, right? And it's like, 
it, it is, oh yeah, Jesus appeared to 500, some of them are dead, some of them are still alive. But, but you're in Corinth, and you can't even verify this. There's no way that you're going to be able to verify this claim. You have no desire to verify it, and I'm not providing any evidence other than a mere assertion that Jesus applied to, uh, appeared to 500, which is better explained by a mistranslation of, of uh, the appearance. And in fact, it's, it's Pentecost, and, not, and, not, and, and there's a really good analysis. So there's an alternative hypothesis that is far, far more likely um, but but the, the, you are not justified. I would claim that even as a Christian, even as a Christian with your background knowledge, you are still not justified in believing Paul's claim that Jesus appeared to 500. But before we get a response to that, Jonathan McClatchy, and I'd like to hear responses to the other issues that Jonathan Pierce has raised as well around the background sort of information that you think makes the resurrection more likely in terms of uh, fulfilled prophecy and, and other aspects uh, so so we'll, we'll get into some of those specifics in just a moment's time. And and in the final part of today's show, I also want to ask what sort of evidence would convince Jonathan Pierce in a resurrection. Uh, and we'll, we'll come to that, I'm sure, in a moment. So you're listening to a special show, uh, Unbelievable, asking, do extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence? We'll be back in a moment. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter. Proper old atheist Christian debate on the show today. Uh, do extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence? We've been asking and we've been particularly looking at modern miracle claims. We've been looking at the central claim of Christianity, the resurrection, something probably we'll do again around Easter this year. But um, Jonathan Pierce is an atheist blogger and writer. His books like uh, The Resurrection, A Critical Examination of the Easter Story, uh, are his uh, way of showing why he believes that the, these kind of miracle claims do not stand up to scrutiny. Jonathan McClatchy is a Christian apologist with a background in biology who's done a lot of work in this area as well. Um, his new resource is called talkaboutdoubts.com. Uh, so go and check that out if uh, you're someone or you know someone who would like to directly engage with a Christian thinker about uh, the evidence for Christianity, uh, doubts and so on. Um, I'll make sure there are links to both my guests, but you can find uh, Jonathan Pierce uh, 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 through a new network that's coming soon, uh, very soon, I believe, called, uh, what's it called again? Um, Only Jonathan? Sky. Only Sky. Only Sky. Um, and uh, Jonathan McClatchy is at jonathanmcclatchy.com as well. Um, okay, Jonathan McClatchy, in this case, um, uh, just... Just come back on some of this, because obviously every time you, you give reasons, you know, from the Bible, either the New Testament or the Old Testament, some of this background information about why you think there is good reason to take these sorts of miracle accounts seriously, especially the resurrection. Every time Jonathan Pierce says, well, look, I just don't think you've got the evidence you think you've got there or the background information, because, you know, we these these prof prophetic accounts were all made up after the fact uh we can't there's no historical evidence archaeological evidence for the existence of many characters in the old testament and the new testament you know you're dealing with just one in that instance of you know the claim of 500 witnesses to the resurrection just one line from a letter from paul to the corinthians which could arguably be interpreted in a different way all of this stuff so you know there's a lot there um where, where would you go with the fact that just every every moment if you like jonathan and Pierce just weighs that background evidence very differently to you. Right. And I'll say this, this is only be able to scratch the surface because as these conversations progress, the number of things you need to talk about increases, it doesn't decrease. <laughs> it so, did. um, yeah. good point. uh, so yeah, there's a lot that could be responded to here and I'm sure Jonathan Pierce feels the same way, but in, in regards to the background information, um, I, I mentioned earlier the trilemma argument, which is a background consideration in regards to the messianic and divine identity of, of Jesus. I disagree with uh, some of uh, what Pierce said in response to to that particular contention. Uh, I think that all four of the synoptic gospels affirm the deity of Christ. I could unpack that in a lot of detail, but that would take up some time, so I'll not distract from our current purpose. But um, I've written extensively on this. I've also done debates that are just focused on that topic. So um, you can check that out. Um, in regards to other types of background evidence, as Justin alluded to, um, I would argue from uh, messianic um, prophecy or the phenomenon of what I sometimes call messianic convergence, which is where you have uh, events which uh, correlate in the Gospels with um, uh, with uh, Old Testament um, features and background in ways that are surprising on the chance of coincidence. Um, and there's a number of examples for that. I'll just give um, two or three. Um, one is um, one that is fairly indisputable. In fact, is that Christianity became 
um, established as a as a worldwide global religion, and that's something which is which is um, predicted in Isaiah forty nine, Isaiah forty two, and elsewhere in the Old Testament that uh, forecast that the Messiah will bring a recognition of the God of Israel to representatives of all nations. Um, that the Messiah will be a light to the Gentiles, that God's salvation will reach to the ends of the earth. Now Jesus uniquely has brought representatives of all nations to a recognition of the God of Israel. And so that, in my opinion, is not sufficient grounds to think that Christianity is true, but it does provide evidence by virtue of the fact that it's more probable or better predicted on the hypothesis that Jesus is the Messiah than on its falsehood. Another example would be that Jesus' um, uh, death coincides with the Feast of Passover. So Jesus... Um, uh, dies uh, on Nisan 15th, according to all four Gospels. Um, I know Pierce disputes that in his book, but I, I would argue that he's in error. Um, and uh, and the, the background to the Feast of Passover, if you look at the Old Testament, is that the Jews were to select a lamb, which uh, they were to, to slaughter, and then they would smear the blood of that lamb on the doorposts of their homes just as they were leaving Egypt. Uh, this is the last of the ten plagues of Egypt uh, in the Exodus account. And um, then when the angel of death passed over the homes and saw the blood, instead of smiting down the firstborn of that household, he would see the blood and pass over. And so that's where the, the idea of Passover comes from. And so Jesus in the New Testament is presented and portrayed as the fulfillment of that Passover lamb, that he is the ultimate Passover lamb that the Passover feast pointed to. And so it's quite a coincidence, it's quite fitting then, that Jesus' death coincides with the feast of Passover. That's a strange that's coincidence. that's completely what you'd expect, given an alternate hypothesis which is the gospel writers want him to be the sacrificial lamb so it's a bit, the whole thing is a rewriting of Yom Kippur where actually Jesus is is the the sacrificial goat and Jesus Barabbas Jesus son of the father that's what Bar Abbas means is is the scapegoat so in 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 uh Jewish ritual you'd have Yom Kippur which is the ritual of atonement and you'd take two goats that were as identical as as they could be and one goat you'd let free in into the wilderness that's a scapegoat that's Jesus bar Abbas Jesus son of the father they had to be just like twins and Jesus son of the father is executed so this other goat is executed turns out that the ones executed often has a a, a scarlet um ribbon like tied around it and even thorns so then you start well why is Matthew attaching a scarlet robe to Jesus because he wants so what they're doing is they're writing theology they're not writing history you what you're doing is you're presupposing this is just historical and he's saying look how look how well this accords with the theology here so it must be true is written so that it accords with theology like what you want to look at are things well, like the well, historically I, verifiable i, I want to ask jonathan mcclatchy you know whether whether he agrees with you on that because another point of view i suppose jonathan mcclatchy is that jonathan pierce is presupposing that it was all created, you know, invented after the fact to fulfil Messianic prophecy. Your view, obviously, is that no, in fact, the there are various events that could not have been orchestrated or things and so on that were being honestly historically reported. So why, why do you think that's the more likely sort of piece of evidence we're looking at than, than Jonathan Pierce's view that this is all was all effectively theology written after the fact? So, for sure, I, I think that um, we need to look at the Gospels uh, as a whole to determine, are they holistically reliable? And I think that the evidence overwhelmingly suggests that the Gospels and Acts are written by individuals who are close up to the facts, they're well-informed and habitually truthful. And we can look at particular de uh, details regarding um, Jesus' crucifixion, and it's uh, the the crucifixion is just anchored in it being um, Nisan 15th. Um, so, for example, um, if we... Um, but you're using the Gospels to prove the yeah. Gospels. You're presupposing the truth Well, of I think Gospels. that's legitimate. I'm not presupposing the truth, okay. but I am using but, the Gospels as evidence for the reliability of the Gospels, sure. So written 40 to 80 years by non-eyewitness. We don't know who the authors were. We don't know where they wrote it. We don't know when they wrote it, although we can guess. They're ex post facto agendas, which means they already believe there's a Messiah. Then they're writing about uh, the, the, the accounts of, of their lives. They are writing in order to propagandize, to... to uh, persuade the 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 audience of certain things uh they use no historiographical uh techniques at all that are recognizable uh, other than luke occasionally mentions some people that existed and some places that existed and and th and you can't verify the claims and they weren't verified so this is just such po low level evidence yeah sorry go, go ahead jonathan mcclatchy sure so this is a very um lengthy discussion and as, yeah. as i said before the number of things that we want to discuss increases over time doesn't decrease um but uh, let me. Let, so I, I think that the Gospels and Acts are 
demonstrably reliable. Um, I, I think you can confirm the gospel reliability by looking at um, hallmarks of verisimilitude, such as uh, undesigned coincidences, which I've written a lot about. Uh, I'm sure Jonathan is familiar with that argument. Um, extra biblical corroborations of the gospel accounts. Um, he meant uh, Jonathan Pierce mentioned. Um, the um, um, literary techniques that he says that the Gospels don't employ, and he, this is also an argument he makes in his book, um, and I think that this is very um, a weak argument. Uh, I can give an example. So uh, one of the arguments, for instance, and he gets this from Richard Carrier, is that Luke doesn't cite his sources, and this was a very common ancient technique, was to cite your sources. And... None of them cite right. their sources. Exactly. So. So if we look at um, some of these other ancient sources, such as uh, Thucydides, for example, in his Peloponnesian War, here's a quote from uh, Thucydides, who says, with reference to the speeches in this history, some have some were delivered before the war began, others while it was going on, some I heard myself, others I got from various quarters. But as to the actions of the war, I have not been content to report them on the authority of any chance informant or from my own conception of them, but either from personal knowledge where I was present or after the most careful investigation possible in every case, where I gained my information from others, very laborious were these inquiries, since those who were present in the several um, actions did not all give the same account of the same affair, but as they were swayed by favor to one side or the other, as the, uh, or as their memory served them. Possibly this avoidance of any fabulous embellishments were, uh, may, may make my work less entertaining, but I should be well content if those shall pronounce my history useful, who desire to gain a view of events as they really did happen, and as they are very likely, in accordance with human nature, to repeat themselves at some future time. And it's designed rather as a possession forever than as a mere prize of a composition to be listened to for the moment. So there's an example, um, and I can give other examples, um, of an ancient author giving a very similar introduction to Luke. He does, it's not, um, so, um, he, the, uh, so we, we find both uh, Thucydides as well as Dionysus of uh, Helicarnassus doing very much what Luke does. Uh, they give their own um, credentials on the topic by talking about the kind of sources that they sought, uh, but not naming them. Um, and so the, the resemblance to... Luke doesn't, no, Luke doesn't do that. I'm going to call you out on that because Luke, Luke categorically does not do what Thucydides does there. Thucydides gives a heck of a lot more detail about his historiographical techniques there and who his sources are and how he uses the sources. Luke says, this has been passed down, blah, 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 but this says nothing nearly so long as what you've just said or of the same quality of you just said. And Thucydides Thucydides also admits that he makes up speeches. He says that, you know, I think it's what was broadly what they, it's in the spirit of what they said, whereas none of the Gospels, which are jam-packed full of speech, you tell me any history book in, in ancient time that has speech that we think is accurate, who was there writing it down, what, you know, I, I, I don't know, no, I would just have to disagree with that, I'm sorry. So I, I think that, that, yeah, I think that is, has a striking resemblance to the prologue that we find in Luke. Uh, Luke says, and as much as many under, have undertaken to compile a narrative of things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certain to concern the things that you have been taught. So just like Thucydides, he doesn't name his sources, but he does indicate the type of sources that he's used in constructing his account. It's about a tenth of the length and didn't have nearly as many of the claims. I mean, it's interesting because what happens... So with Thucydides, though, is, is we look at extra extra um, Thucydides accounts, accounts outside of Thucydides to see what, what corroborates his claims, right? With, with Let's take Matthew 28. So you've got dead... Zombie, you've got zombie saints parading around Jerusalem, so which is interesting because Jesus isn't the first fruits of the resurrection. You've already got resurrected saints that apparently Matthew says were seen by many in Jerusalem. You've got an earthquake, you've got three hours of darkness, and you've got the renting of the of the of the temple veil in the Holy of Holies. Right, all of those are magnificently incredible claims. And none of them are attested to outside of Matthew, barely. Well, at least the zombies and, and the, uh, the uh, earthquake are Matthew only. Uh, otherwise, it's just a couple of the Gospels attest these things. And you're telling me that, that Josephus wouldn't report the fact that, that dead zombies paraded around Jerusalem and many saw these dead zombies. And that the Holy the Holies, the, the temple veil is this most sacrosanct um, relic in, or artifact in Jewish, like, um, in the Jewish religion. And to, to think that was ripped in two and not reported by any Jew outside of the Gospels, which are all four codependent like texts are really based on Mark, 
with embellishments. It, I think it, uh, that's what I have problems with, which is this is not the level of evidence that, that, okay. that we well, should there's, expect. There's, there's another whole bag of things to potentially respond to there, Jonathan. I'm, I'm aware of time yeah. is, is getting away from us. And right. I, I am also interested in hearing your response to this 500 witnesses objection as well from Jonathan Pierce. But OK, uh, what, what about some of these claims around the passion story, the rising of the saints, the ripping of the ten- temple curtain? Um, uh, where, where, where do you go with the, the fact that for Jonathan Pierce, given that it's only mentioned in this one source, it's it's not a, a reliable piece of evidence? Right, sure. Um, and this is, of course, uh, um, a species of the argument from silence, which I think is a very, very weak historical argument. Um, and uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. Timothy McGrew, actually has a, an academic paper where he reviews the argument from silence and exposes why it's so weak. And the reason it's weak is because when you calibrate your expectations by looking at other ancient sources from that time period, um, you you find that there are plenty of examples of events that you would expect to be recorded, which aren't in particular sources. So, uh, and furthermore, most of the literature from Palestine in the first century has been lost. So even if someone else wrote about the event, it's not particularly predicted that you would still have the work. Um, and uh, I can give a, here's just a couple examples um, of things that we have that we have very good reason to think happened, but ancient sources pass over them in detail, even though you would expect them to talk about them. Josephus and Philo uh, both, both pass over... Do they break the laws of nature, well, though? Can you, let me finish. So Josephus and Philo both pass over the expulsion of the Jews from Rome by Claudius in silence, um, though it's mentioned um, by the 2nd century Roman historian Suetonius, and it's also mentioned in passing in Acts 18, verse 2. Um, and despite Josephus's silence on that, um, all historians acknowledge that that event took place. Another example is that no first century source that we now have reports the destruction of Pompeii and her Colanium in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in AD 79, although Pliny the Younger gives a detailed account of the eruption himself. In fact, his uncle, Pliny the Elder, was killed in that eruption. But no one infers from Pliny's silence that the event didn't take place. The only first century source that we have of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem is Josephus. Um, but we don't infer from the fact that no one... We've had- literally got Herculaneum. We've literally got the remains of Herculaneum and Pompeii. Like, you can't... I mean, wow. But I'm using... I'm using uh, the, the, these examples to illustrate that even for events that we know took place, such as the destruction of Herculaneum and Pompeii, uh, we have ancient sources that um, that pass over it, even though Plenty of the Younger talks about the eruption, he passes over the destruction of these major cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum. And there are plenty of examples of that where you have these major events, the, the expulsion of the Jews from Rome was a major event that, um, that uh, we, no first century source talks about. Um, and uh, apart from Acts. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Well, well let, let me come to another point that, that Jonathan Pierce raised earlier, which is this uh, bit part of Second Corinthians 15, I think it is, where as Paul is recounting, you know, the events of um, the Jesus and the uh, Last Supper and the resurrection. And he says that 500 witnesses, um, some of whom have died, but some of whom are still alive. Um, and f- again, the fact that you referenced that as a piece of um, evidence uh, was why Jonathan was responding to that, saying he, that's not a good piece of evidence. You, it's one assertion in one letter uh, that no one would have been able to check uh, and so on. What, what's your what's your response to that kind of? Sure. It was actually Jonathan, Jonathan Pierce that brought that up. I didn't actually mention that. Um, Sorry. But uh, I, I and I don't consider it to be a major line of evidence. The the appearance of the 500 that Paul writes about in First Corinthians 15. Um, uh, but, uh, and I think it's subject to some of the vulnerabilities that Jonathan Pierce talked about, that he doesn't name them and it's not clear that they would have had access or been able to go and check with these 500 witnesses. So it's not a major part of my apologetic approach to the resurrection. But I would argue, um, I, I disagree with the approach, and we've discussed this before in your program, Justin, with um, the approach taken by Gary Habermas, the minimal facts approach, um, which basically... Um, a, a major part of that approach is limiting one's case for the resurrection to the Pauline corpus, especially text like First Corinthians 15, 3 through 7, uh, and so forth. Uh, I think that you cannot make a robust case for the resurrection without uh, bringing in the Gospels. And I think that you can make a robust case for gospel reliability from undesigned coincidences, extra biblical corroborations, and other hallmarks of verisimilitude, uh, the unity of character portrayals across the, the Gospels in different settings and contexts and so forth, all of which point to the the reliability of the gospel accounts. And therefore, if the gospels are indeed substantially trustworthy accounts written by individuals who are close up to the facts and well-informed, then uh, it suggests strongly that the 
reports that we have in the Gospels concerning the nature and variety of the post-resurrection encounters with the risen Jesus uh, are coming from or reflecting the eyewitness testimony. And therefore, that's what we need to explain when we're trying to explain how they why they're making those claims. Is it that they are yeah. deceiving us or is it they're honestly mistaken we're, or Jesus we're, rising from the dead? We're, we're, we're almost out of time. And I'm aware we spent a lot of the show really debating the specifics of the evidences here and, and the back and forth and, and less probably on the, the, the general case of the, the sort of thought about extraordinary claims, extraordinary evidence and so on. Um, uh, what Just briefly, Jonathan Pierce. If you were to be convinced that Jesus had risen from the dead, is there any kind of evidence, you know, that could convince you at this point? Or is it sort of something that's in the past now and therefore intrinsically impossible for you to sort of be convinced about? So uh, there's a really good question. Uh, and the simple answer is I don't know because of something called doxastic involuntarism. So this is in philosophy. Um, as a, uh, bit of jargon there it's the fact that when we uh, assent to a proposition when we believe something we don't do it voluntarily so if i asked either of you oh the moon is uh, i said if i say the moon is made of cheese can you can you believe that the moon is made of cheese you wouldn't be able to change your belief voluntarily so you don't have doxastic voluntarism to, in order to uh, just change your belief and then put your mortgage on the fact that that yes the the moon is made of cheese so what happens is we we believe things rather intuitively once a certain threshold is met in our non-conscious brains given an amount of evidence that we can't really actually um, express verbally because we're not really sure like so I could give mm. you some amount of evidence and might in principle be enough but I just don't know whether when it came to it that would be enough what I'm fairly confident in saying is that the gospels and Paul are not good enough evidence I don't think they're even good enough evidence even if you do believe in miracles so I wanted to talk about biblical hermeneutic circularity earlier which is the fact that the reason that, that I think JM believes in miracles is because he believes in in the resurrection I think he believes in resurrection because he believes in miracles and I think there's a circularity that's going on there but we probably don't have time but that's super important because it's all about what we're bringing to the table and that's why we're talking about how we uh, we, we did get onto the gospels and how reliable they are because that's where this goes where, where this goes Mm. is why is it that i think the gospels are this good and he thinks they're that good and and this so I, i'm happy we got here and it, and jm's absolutely right there's like 50 million more questions to answer yes that there, there, there are indeed i, I mean and, and as for you jonathan mcclatchy do you think that this particular phrase this maxim extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence has has been used to simply i don't know bat away skeptics have used it to bat away really having to deal with the evidence full stop because they set the bar in a sense can set the bar so high that that they don't have to deal with any any kind of claim right absolutely um any any proposition with a non-zero prior probability that is to say that it doesn't entail some sort of logical incoherence um can in principle be demonstrated if you have sufficient evidence and any miracle claim no matter how improbable can in principle be demonstrated with sufficient testimonial evidence because testimony is a form of evidence and if you have enough of it then the improbability of the testimony will eventually become greater than the improbability of the miracle um, but i think the key bone of contention between myself and jonathan is uh, how we assess the prior probability and of course there's a lot of background assumptions and this is one of the weaknesses i think of doing debates like this um, in such a short time frame is that um, we have there, there's very little common ground between myself and Jonathan, and so we have to start um, a way back at um, at an earlier point. Um, I obviously do think that you can make a robust case that the Gospels are substantially reliable and close up to the facts. Jonathan doesn't think that, but to discuss that would require a whole debate in itself. Um, and the same with a lot of the things that we've only been able to scratch the surface on today. He mentioned uh, that uh, it's, there's a circular argument at play, and I, I don't think that is the case. Um, um, so um, I, I think that, um, for, first of all, as I said, the prior probability of a miracle is non-zero unless you can show some sort of logical incoherence. And so it can be demonstrated with evidence even if the prior probability is very low. And secondly, um, I, I think that there is evidence that prov that informs our background considerations, such as um, the um, the miracle testimonies documented by Keener and others, um, the uh, the uh, evidence bearing on Jesus' messianic and divine identity that's independent of the resurrection bears on our background considerations. The fact that the resurrection is something that's prophesied in Isaiah fifty three ten, uh, and Jesus, of course, claims that the resurrection will be his own uh, vindic the vindication of his messianic and divine self claims. All of that feeds into our background considerations. And so I, I do think there's any circularity going on there 
we're going to have to leave it there. I appreciate there's lots that Jonathan Pierce would want to respond to even in that <laughs> closing statement of yours, Jonathan McClatchy. But we, we will leave it there um, and appreciate that, hey, maybe maybe we can, you know, delve into one specific aspect of this again at some point in the future. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you. Isaiah you... 53, the rest of it doesn't apply to Jesus at all. <laughs> oh, but... well, well. See, we're already we're already doing the comebacks. Well, we well, maybe we'll do a proper debate on the these sort of prophecies that are often used um, uh, in defence of Jesus's uh, messiahship and resurrection. But for the now, we will say goodbye. Thank you both, Jonathan M and Jonathan P, for being with me on the show Thank today. You, you can find links to the books we've referenced, the articles to talkaboutdoubts.com dot com, and more besides with today's show. But for now, thanks both Jonathans uh, for a great discussion. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.